power, the source of blessing, was prayer. We're going to continue in that thought, and we're going to look at the people of prayer from Acts, the book of Acts. We're going to see how God worked in the church, how the church grew, not because of the church programs, but because of the church praying. And that's what uh, I would like to challenge us with this evening, as we are the people of prayer. That's the sermon title tonight, The People of Prayer. We are in Acts chapter 1, and remember last week we talked about uh, because Jesus ascended, we can pray, we can have ministry, we can grow. We've been given the authority to pray, the authority to serve and work and, and, and win the lost. Let's look at uh, Acts chapter 1, and we'll read verses 12 to 14. And again, let's go ahead and, you know what, let's review verse 3 and 4 real quickly. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them they that they should not depart from Jerusalem, <clears throat> but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days thence. And so he has told the church, go back to Jerusalem, wait for me. Wait for the promise that I've promised you, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. You will be, will be endued from power on high. And we see that promise continued in Acts verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Look what it says there. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So there's the promise. The power of the Holy Spirit is going to come. Wait. Tarry in Jerusalem until it comes. And so what do they do after Jesus ascends into heaven? They go back to Jerusalem. They go back to the upper room, probably. Look at verses 12 to 14. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went in unto an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. And here's the key verse. <clears throat> These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So the first meeting in the church was a prayer meeting after Jesus ascended. What did they do? According to verse 14, it says they all continued. The word continued means that they gave themselves to constantly pray. They're persevering in prayer. That was their main business. That was their devotion. That was their prayer and probably prayed for what was promised in Acts 1 verse 3 through 5 and verse 8 the power of the Spirit, for the Holy Spirit to come. And that's what they were probably praying in regards to. So the idea that they continued, their main business was prayer. They constantly prayed, and that's what the apostles would do later in Acts 6, 4. Remember what they said? We will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So it is their main and constant work to be continuing in prayer. That's where the power comes from. Paul would say this in Colossians 4, 2. Continue in prayer. In other words, don't stop. Be continually praying and watching the same with thanksgiving. Paul would also say in Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant. That is, continuing constantly in prayer. That was the church's emphasis. That should be ours as well. So go back to verse 14. It says, they all continued with one accord. So they're continually, continuing in prayer, continuing in one accord, that is, with one mind. They were united. They were joined together. Uh, this, this word is found 11 times in the book of Acts and once in Romans 15.6. We'll go over some of these ones in, verse, in the book of Acts, but Romans 15.6 says it in this way. Paul is commanding the, the, the Romans that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they continued, they constantly persevered in prayer and single-mindedness. They were united. The idea here is that there were no schisms. 
There was no divisions. Uh, there was no divided interest. There was no opposing purposes. They were all single-minded, with one accord, with one mind, with, uh, you, with uh, a, a united front. And this is a beautiful picture of how the church is single-minded. Uh, the classic psalm is Psalm 133, about the church being uh, united. Listen to Psalm 133. It, it begins this way. It says, Behold... How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in, you know the next word? Unity. And so that's the idea here. They are unified in prayer. They they expect the blessing of God. They they desire the blessing of God. And so we have them wanting God's blessing. Jesus has ascended from the earth at this point. He tells them to go in Jerusalem and wait. Wait. And the apostles have no other recourse, right? What are they going to do? Without the physical presence of Jesus, they're going to pray. That's what they're going to depend on. They're going to depend on him and the promise that he made about receiving their power. So their doubts and their difficulties all channel them, funnel them towards prayer. That's where we ought to be. So after this meeting, after this prayer meeting now, comes a business meeting. Okay, they pray, they're unified. Um, There's a business meeting in verse 15, but let me just set the stage here. Judas has by this time hung himself. They're looking for someone to replace. There's something significant about having 12 apostles, so they're, they're wanting to replace Judas. There are about 120 people in the upper room. No doubt they began with prayer, and they're about to have this this business meeting about how they're going to replace Judas. They have something in common. They are praying, and they're waiting, and the, the the word koinonia, fellowship, we'll find in the next chapter, but they have things in common. They're desiring the power of the Holy Spirit, the promise to be fulfilled that Jesus told them to wait for. There are many things that they have in common as of right now. They have the same Savior. They're about to have the same Holy Spirit indwell them. In the next chapter, we'll see that happen. They are in fellowship, and they they have the same fate. There is a prepared place for them. Jesus said that. Okay, so they, they have things in common. There can be no deeper kind of fellowship than when the family of God gathers together in prayer. Because if you think about it, there are the, sa- the saints, the saved people, and then there's the Savior. And when they're in fellowship together in prayer, there is no deeper fellowship. Not only are we together as a church, but God is also with us. There is no deeper fellowship than the fellowship of the church when it's in prayer. So that's what we have here, the business meeting in verse 15. But let, before we get to verse 15, let's uh, look at the end of verse 14. What did they do? They continued in prayer. They were one-minded. And now we're going to see who. Who was it that was continuing in prayer with one accord or one mind? We see in verses 13 and 14, in which we've just read, that there were men and women involved. Okay, If you look back down to verse uh, 13 and 14, 13 all the apostles or the remaining apostles were listed. In verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So who were the people of prayer in the church? Well, there was men, there was women, there was the wives of the apostles. There were recent, there were mature believers, three or three, you know, at least a dozen or a couple of dozen of those who walked with Jesus, or at least knew those who walked with Jesus for three years, the apostles and their wives. Then there was the women who followed and ministered unto Jesus for those three years. Then there was Mary, the mother of Jesus, as we saw at the end of verse 14, and then there were Jesus' brothers. So Jesus' brothers, during the time of his ministry on earth, they did not believe he was the Messiah. Okay? Okay. We'll find out here, there were men and women, again, of different spiritual maturity, or at least levels of maturity in knowing who Jesus is. 
And then Jesus also, with all the women that followed him, as we read this morning in the scriptures, there were many women that followed and ministered to him and believed. But we, those are what we call the more mature followers. And then there were the new believers. Who were the new believers? They were Jesus' brothers, or at least one. Okay, as it says there, and with his brethren, more than one. How many brothers did he have? Do you guys remember? Matthew 13, 55 says this. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is, this, is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So he had at least four brothers, half brothers. Mark 6, 3, listen to this. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? And they were offended at him. So perhaps some of his sisters were there as well, included as some of the women. But we don't know, but we do know this. There was a mixed multitude, men, women, apostles, their wives, brothers, it is in John chapter 7, verse 5, where we see that his brothers did not believe him. John 7, 5 says this, For neither did his brethren believe in him. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, 7, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared unto James, probably the next brother in line in the family. And James became, became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And we'll read about that in Acts 15. So we know that James became a leader, and who else? What did, was there another brother who had an effect in, in the New Testament church? Who? Judas. He wrote the book of Jude. Jude, right? So the Lord's brothers, two of them at least, had significant impact in the early church. And they were here at this business meeting, which was probably begun with prayer. So there were people here in this business meeting, in this prayer meeting, from different social classes, from different levels of spiritual maturity and knowledge. Look at verse 15, Acts 1, 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, <clears throat> the number of the names together were about 120. He goes, men and brethren... And he goes on, we'll stop there. But, uh, so there's about 120 people in the first church business meeting. They've prayed. There is such a mixed multitude there. There is a zealot. Simon is probably there. Simon the zealot, one of the apostles. He is, he is a, an Israelite nationalist. There are probably scholars there. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus members of the Sanhedrin. There are probably all of his brothers there, or at least a couple of his brothers, Jesus' brothers, half-brothers. There are probably some social outcasts, okay? Harlots that had been forgiven and, and had been converted. Um, those with diseases that were healed. Those that were unclean. So there's a significant number of people there, and there's a mixed multitude of those who would pray. There was even a former government employee there, right? Matthew, Simon, and I, I can imagine the sparks flying between Simon the zealot and Matthew, the former tax collector. There are business owners and landowners there. Okay, Mark, or I'm sorry, um, John Mark's parents, probably, who own the upper room. Um, who else? Who are the fishermen? James and John, their parents probably owned a, a very wide, um, very big fishing industry supplier. So there are, again, rich, poor, extremes on the political spectrum, but they're there. And what are they? They are unified. They are there with one accord, unified in mind and in heart. What unified them was the spirit of prayer. The focus in their meetings was not the pastor, it was not the church program, it was not the music program, it was not the budget, it was not the building. Their focus was the will of God in the person of Jesus Christ. That is what made them unified. Because God works when his people pray together and when they're unified. 
So they continued with one accord. It's unified and fervent prayer. We have already read verse 14. Okay, let me reread the part there. It says, these all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication. So with one accord in supplication, they came to pray. And the next time they meet, it appears that after the business meeting, there comes a time when the Holy Spirit falls on them with power. Now look at Acts 2 verse 1. <clears throat> Acts 2 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with, there's the word, they were all with one accord in one place. So the first time they met in one accord, it was one accord in supplication. The second time they meet in one accord, it is the one accord of anticipation. What were they probably praying for? The promise of, of chapter 1, verse 3 through 5 and verse 8, the coming of the Spirit. Jesus told them to wait, and they're probably praying in that regard. So they are one in supplication, they are one in anticipation. Now look at chapter 2, verse 46, as we see as they continued in one accord. And they, in verse 46, <clears throat> and they continuing daily with, there's the word, one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So here, they are one accord in continuation. They're continuing, if you read a little bit uh, earlier in, the, in verse 42, they're continuing in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. And in the verse we just read, they're continuing in service. So see how prayer begins? It is one accord in prayer. It's one accord in anticipation. God is going to act. We pray. God is going to enter in. He's going, he's going to work through the church for the church. And then here, the, the, they're one accord in continuing in what they ought to be doing, the Apostles' Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer, service. Now look at Acts 4. Turn to Acts 4. We'll see another time when they are in one accord. And when they heard that, in Acts 4.24, and when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. So we see here, they are in one accord in adoration. So having this single-mindedness, this united front in, in the church, they are moving from supplication, anticipation, continuation, and they're in one accord in adoration, in worship and praise as well. Now, flip to Acts chapter 5, verse 12. We'll see again in how they are in one accord. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12, it reads, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So this is after time has passed by. God is working in and through them, and they're all single-minded, single-mindedness of heart, single-mindedness of will, doing God's will, praising, worshiping, and following. We see here in chapter 5, verse 12, that they're, they're in one accord in association. What does that mean? There was no infighting. There's no complaining. There's no negative spirit. There's no divisions. They're unified. And the power of God is working in the church here. Now look at uh, Acts 15, turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 25. <clears throat> In Acts 15, 25, it says, oh, by the way, just to set the stage in Acts 15 here, there are some uh, saved Pharisees. They are going around telling the churches that have been established that Gentiles have to become Jews in order to be saved. They have to get circumcised in order to get saved. And so there's the Jerusalem council where James, the Lord's brother, is presiding. And uh, in Acts 15, 25, it says this. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with, there's the word again, one mind, one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So we see there one accord in terms of their purpose. This is what we need to do, and we all agree that this is what we need to do. We're going to send representatives. Paul and Barnabas is going to go. They're going to bring men with them, and they're going to instruct the churches, you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. However, don't eat meat, don't do all those regulations that all the Jews observe. 
So they're one accord here in determination. The decision that needed to be made, they were all with one accord. They were of the same mind. So if you look at the progression again from these six verses that we've looked at, okay, they're of one mind in regards to supplication, prayer. We all know that we need to pray. We all know that we need to depend on God. We all know that we need to pray that God's will be done. So they're one accord in supplication. They're one accord in anticipation. God is going to work. He's going to send us the power. That's when they got the Holy Spirit of God on Pentecost. They're one accord in continuation. They knew the purposes of the church, you know, apostle doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread. We're going to continue in prayer. We're going to continue to serve. They're one accord in adoration. They were, they were worshiping and praising God of the same mind, with the same mind. They're one accord in association. When they were together, there was no infighting, no division, no backbiting. They were with one accord in association and then one accord in determination. When the church needs to make a decision, that's what it needs to do as well. Be of one accord in determination. And that's what they did when they sent out Paul and Barnabas. So all of this happens. You know why? It began with prayer. The fellowship of prayer. That's what brings the church together. We all need to be unified in prayer. We ought to be involved in the church's prayer ministry. We'll see here in the book of Acts that it was in these group meetings that they were with one accord. But then there's also smaller meetings inside where they are one accord. Okay, we'll see. Turn to Acts chapter 3, if you would. We'll see that leaders in the church need to pray. Um, Acts chapter 3, many of you know this as a children's song. You know, Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way, right? You know that song? Um, we see that church leaders need to gather together to pray. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> now Peter and John went up together. There's that fellowship. Into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. This is interesting. Here are members of a totally new body, a new age, the church age, still observing the temple prayer hours. They go at the ninth hour, which is hour 3 p.m. So they're, they, they, even though they were still members of the church, they're observing the Jewish prayer hours. And what are the Jewish prayer hours? Um, keep your finger in Acts, but turn to Psalm Verse 55, if you would. If you've uh, disciplined yourself to pray, you know this, that unless you set aside time to pray, most likely you will not pray. If you understand your own nature, your human nature, yes, I do have an attitude of prayer everywhere I go. You know, I need a parking spot, I need this, I need that, boom, I, I'm right there. I, I shoot up a prayer to the God of heaven, like Nehemiah says. But look at Psalm 55, verse 17. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my, my voice. Now, if you tie that in with Acts chapter 3, verse 1, evening is the 3 p.m. prayer hour. That's what they considered the evening. Morning is the 9 a.m. prayer hour. We'll read about that again in the book of Acts here in just, in just a minute or so. Noon, that's the sixth hour. So here are structured prayer times. Not a commandment. Okay, Not commanded. Not prescribed. But set apart. To pray. Now... Turn to Daniel. Now, you're not too far from Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. We know that Daniel was a man of prayer. We know even when the command was, was commanded, you cannot pray to anyone except to, to Nebuchadnezzar. What does Daniel do? He doesn't miss a beat, right? He does what he's always done. And what does he always do? Turn to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. 
We'll see that Daniel structured his prayer times. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. So Daniel disciplined himself to pray three times a day. And most likely, it was the same as Psalm 55, 17. In the evening, in the morning, and at noon will I pray. So structured prayer hours are good. Time set apart for the church to pray, it's good. Wednesday nights, we don't do that. We're split up everywhere. And that's why I want to change Sunday nights into something like what we're going to do. We get together to pray. The church had a structured prayer time too. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 2, verse 15. And <clears throat> this is when they received the, the Holy Spirit and the, the town thinks that they're all drunk. Okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 15. It says, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It was about 9 a.m. So apparently they were praying at around this time. The morning hour of prayer. Now turn to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we'll see another time of structured prayer timing of prayer. In Acts 10, verse 9, it says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. The sixth hour is noon. And it says he got hungry and then he had the dream, you remember. So, again, a disciplined hour, structured time of prayer, three times a day observed by believers in the New Testament church. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Turn back to Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, you know what? Did I just read that? Yeah, I did. They went up the ninth hour, which is about 3 p.m. That's the evening prayer. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Now, in Acts chapter 10, verse 30, I know I'm having you flip around here. Acts chapter 10, verse 30. Here is somebody who is following the Jewish prayer schedule. That's not even a believer yet. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon... So you see here, these structured times of prayer were just as a given, that uh, they, they had consistent times of prayer. And so these church leaders, Peter and John, they were meeting to pray together, probably on a regular basis. They had different personalities. You know, Peter was a little bit more bombastic and, and, and loud and brash. John was more silent and simple, yet he, John was forceful. Just read his letters. Very simple, yet forceful at the same time, just moving forward. Yet they could both work together, serve together, and pray together as church leaders. So let me encourage you, you know, if, if you are youth workers, see if you can set aside some time to work and pray together. If you are Sunday school teachers, see if you can find the time, and maybe we'll do that on Sunday nights too. If you teach ever, Set aside some time to pray together, especially about the ministry that, that God has given you to oversee. So we gathered together for many reasons, but church leaders here, Peter and John, they met together to pray, and so should the church leaders. Now, as the last point here, and I'll be done, Acts 21, verse 5, we'll see, Acts 21, verse 5, we'll see that the church has families, and the families pray. Read Acts chapter 20, 21, verse 5 with me, or follow along as I read here. This is when um, they're sending Paul off as the context here. He's, he's leaving. It says, And when he had accomplished those days, we departed and went our way, and they all brought us on our way, 
And who's praying here? With wives and children. Children, do you see that? Don't check out. These children are gathering in on the prayers of the church as well. With wives and children till we were out of the city, and we kneeled down on the shore and prayed. This is a farewell meeting for the Apostle Paul. Husbands and wives are together. Children are with them, kneeling. Remember, kneeling is an attitude of reverence and humility. Kneeling and praying together. Church families need to pray together. Moms and dads need to set the example for family prayer. Do your children know that you pray? Do they see that you pray? If your children are outside of the home, do your grown children and your grandchildren, do they know it's a given that grandma and grandpa will pray for us? Again, moms and dads need to set the example. If we are men and women of prayer, our children will grow up to be men and women of prayer. Prayer protects the home. Prayer protects the children. Prayer protects the missionaries when we pray for them. So get to know your missionaries. Use the prayer cards. Use family time to pray. And as I close here, I I want you to think of this thought, okay? I do not think there's any fellowship deeper than when the church gathers to pray. There is no deeper time of fellowship. God is present. Christ is present. The will of God is the matter. And as we saw here, young believers, old believers, moms, dads, children, all in the church were involved in prayer. And we see through the book of Acts that God works in the church that prays. He works in the church and through the church that prays. And so tonight, um, we're going to use it as ne- next five, ten minutes as prayer time. And I've asked a couple of men to pray for us. Um, you know what? Everybody stand up for one second. I want you to stretch out and then we're going to get down <laughs> and pray again because you're a little bit warm and sleepy eyed here. Um, Okay, stretch, okay, we're going to, okay, stretch, wake up. (laughs) Remember the power that was in the New Testament church came through prayer. We are now here unified to pray. Just as the time when we take um, or we we remember the Lord's Supper, I'm going to have just a few seconds of silence where you all confess your own sins to God. And then I'm going to have you sit. In fact, you go ahead, go ahead and sit down now. <laughs> and have you sit. After about a few seconds of your personal prayer, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dwight McIntyre to pray, and then he will be followed by Paul Rowlands. And uh, let's pray for the power of God and all the things that I've spoken about today in anticipation of God's blessing and using us to, to reach and have a passion for souls anticipation of of us being one-minded in the decisions that will need to be made for the church in the next few months, all right? And your own personal walk with God as well, all right? So let's all all bow in prayer, and then uh, Brother Dwight, and then Paul after him, and then I will close.